Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, happy of all day. ages, of all ages, of all skill levels. How's everybody doing out there on the internet this fine Wednesday? Hey, hey guys, how you doing, Nate? I'm good. good, doing well. Sunny day here in VB. Yeah. All right. We'll let. Uh, we'll give as always the. We learned it's a 45 second delay here, so no wonder. Significant. We we ask a question and then we just sit here patiently and wait for 45 seconds and then you hear it and then you respond. So. We're going to give you a minute or two to get in here and join us. Seeing a couple people pouring in. Two, five, seven. It's growing. <laughs> Munchy Munch on YouTube says, yo, this goes live as soon as my class starts. Lots of laughs. I guess I'm skipping. Yes. I can't condone you skipping class. Say no to school. But Not you really. could probably skip a little bit of class <laughs> every now and again. It's not the worst. Just move your mouse every now and then so your teacher knows that you're you're paying attention on that Zoom call. That's right. Ironically, both of our wives are school teachers teaching virtually. That's true. That's how we know all of your tri tricks there, Munchy Munch. That's right. Richard, what's going on? Good to see you, brother. All right. We'll give it another minute or two. If, you, if this is your first time attending one of these Plus Live trainings, do us a favor. <laughs> just comment below. Let us know where you're watching from. Country, city, state. Not in that order. Country, state, city. <laughs> Siraj says, watching this during work, my man. My Howdy, man. sir. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Richard says he's been working on his strokes. Yeah, Richard, did that, uh, did that video analysis on the last call help? Hopefully that gave you, uh, gave you some things to work on. How'd that turn out for you? Guys, as you're flowing in here, comment. Let us know where you're from. We're get, we get some, some people flowing in here. We'll start in about a minute or two. Neil from Cleveland, Ohio. Very good to see you. Uh, the Kelvinator watching from Howdy, London. Neil. Very nice. All right. Um, shall we? Let's shall get we get it. this party started? You know what we're going to need, other than my mic receiver that I just dropped, <laughs> is a magic marker. So you guys wait patiently here, and I'm going to get a magic marker. Shall I entertain? Yeah. If you can I'll say show you guys nice a couple of juggling tricks. Not really. So we're talking about uh, visual cues today. Uh, the, really important when we're talking about ant anticipation, whether we're talking about singles or doubles. When we're hitting the ball, once that, that ball has left our strings, there's not a whole lot that we can do about it. But what we can do is be collecting a lot of data about what is coming back to us. And that is what we're talking about. We're talking about these visual cues to improve our game. What's up, Bob? <laughs> Dog on the live stream. You, look, you like me now because you want to be famous. Everybody say hi to Ava, my dog. All right, we got a lot more people saying what's up here. Uh, Daniel from Austria. I can't pronounce this, uh, but from Greece, V A G G E L S, Vagelis. I don't know. I don't want, I'm sure I'm butchering but, but, that. Hey, I'm sorry, thanks for joining us. Thank you for watching from Greece. Joan from Florida. Roberto, our dude from Costa Rica. What up, Roberto? All right, I've got our clean wipe here and our marker. So, yeah, shall we get this party started? Let's get it. All right, so. Guys, thanks for tuning in. If you've never joined one of these <coughs> things, what we got going on here is a plus live training. If you have no idea what Play Your Court Plus is or if this is your first live training, here's what we've got going on. You guys are probably all familiar by now with the Play Your Court membership where we try and help you meet other players in your area no matter where you are in the world. We have video coaching for you all for just six bucks a month. So if you're not in there, definitely uh, it's a no-brainer. We did that on purpose. So jump in there for sure. But if you are really looking to take your game to another level, you want to take a deeper dive into the video instruction, you want to interact with Nate and I on, on live streams like this, we've got a tier of membership called Play Your Court Plus. These calls and these live streams are specifically for Plus members. Typically, we will broadcast them on all social channels, but inside your Plus dashboard, you can see a schedule of what we got coming up, and you'll also see recordings of all of these calls that we've ever done. So if you see, oh man, you know, on Wednesday, they're going over the, the keys to poach, but I can't make that call. No worries. The recording will be inside your Plus Live dashboard. So that's what we got going on here. Um, the structure for today, and it changes a little bit. Sometimes we just do straight up Q&As where we just jump in here and answer your questions. Sometimes it's a video analysis call where you know Plus members will send in footage of their strokes. We'll analyze them live on this call. Today is almost more of like a us from the podium presenting, but we'll of course open up the floor for Q&A. So the way this this stream will work is we will dive into coaching. We'll go over a couple cues on how to poach. We'll pause, ask questions, go into more information. And then at the end, we'll open up, you know, hopefully about 10, 15 minutes 
for any additional questions that you have. But without further ado, let's drive right in. So what we were just talking about when you stepped away, we're talking about visual cues, but Scott does a, a good job explaining the, the you know, good anticipation versus great anticipation. And I think we start there because we need to talk about why it's important that we understand uh, visual cues and why we need to be looking for them. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the bottom line is a lot of players that get stuck both in singles and in doubles, really. I know today mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, doubles, poaching cues, but really singles or doubles, a lot of players get stuck because they're very focused on what they have going on and they're not seeing what's happening on the other side of the net. So to take your game to the next level, if you really want to start playing at a high 4-0, 4-5 level, or, or really compete at, at a serious level of play, you're going to have to start paying attention a lot more to what you're seeing on the other side of the net, racket face, patterns, just different things that you're seeing to try and anticipate what's going to happen in the point. And what I always say in, in our live workshops, I'll say good tennis is reactionary. That would be, you know, I see my opponents pulled really far out wide and reaching and he's going to hit a weak ball. So I decide to move in and hit a volley for a winner. Great tennis would be anticipatory, meaning I hit that forehand big and I know it's going to cause my opponent to be reaching and pop that ball up. So I'm going to leave and I'm going to get to the net sooner. And then now that volley winner is maybe inside the service line in a much easier shot. So the better you can anticipate what you're seeing on the other side of the net, singles, doubles, anything, you're always going to have better results and you're going to have a much easier time figuring out what's coming back when you start to look for these cues. So I think if you're cool with it, Nate, the, the way to start here, um, let's look at visual cues to poach right off the return of serve, right? So we've got... Yeah. So, and we'll get in obviously to what happens during the point, but let's just start with um, our standard one up, one back, beginning of every doubles point. And let's talk about what to do if your partner is back here serving and you're this dot up here at the net. What can we look for in this position to decide, make automatic decisions right away? whether or not to poach. And I'll go over the easy ones because Nate's a better coach than me, so I call dibs on the easy instruction. Um, you're going to hear this <laughs> a lot from coaches. We want your partner to serve up the tee. Um, and here's why. If your partner serves up the tee, I really struggle to draw lines. It's pretty good, though. That's one of your better ones. Thanks. If your partner serves up the tee, obviously it pulls the returner more towards the middle of the court. And if you look here, there's not really an angle from here to hit the ball past you down the line unless you're just absolutely snoozing, right? So we've got a player here sitting in the dead center of their box. If they just step out and reach their racket out, they're going to close this ball off. So right out of the gates, if your partner back on the baseline serves up the tee, that to me is an automatic visual cue to look to pinch middle and hopefully cut this return off. So, and let me just interject on that. So the pinch middle is the big key here because we hear this a lot. Assuming this is a righty on this side of the court, the natural rotation is that when they hit their hips come around, they're going to want to pull the ball back behind you. But to what Scott's saying with this pinch, it's almost impossible for this ball to get around this player because it has to cross their path if they pinch. So if this player, maybe maybe this player hates volleying and they're just back here not to be attacked. If they stay here and they look to poach, they can get beat because the ball doesn't have to be that good. But that angle is relatively really difficult till you get to a higher level. 4-5, it's not all that difficult. But at 3-5, it's very difficult. However, at every single level, if you pinch first, so when we talk about pinching, what does that mean? We, we hear it commonly referred to as squeezing means you get tighter to the net because now even if this ball was to be played out here, you're only one or two steps away from cutting it off. Now, once you see that they've committed to going back down through the middle of the court or cross court, you're one or two steps away from cutting off that, that poach as well. Um, I'll add something there too. One of the things, and we coach this in, in person, we coach it in, in a video course. Oh, by the way, we're hooking you up. If you stick around to the end of this training, I'm going to drop a link in here where you can get 75% off our, what is it called? Doubles Movement Mastery course. If you're a plus that. member, you already Very have cool. it. But if you're uh, not a plus member and you're watching this and you want to go into like way more detail on all that is doubles, 
We're going to drop a link here in the bottom to get that course for just 49 bucks. So definitely stick around and check that out. But um, one thing I want you to really think about when you're in this position up at the net, if you just assume when your partner serves tea that you can poach and that you don't need to worry about your line, things can go wrong, right? Like you need to have equal distribution on both your right and left foot here and make sure that you're still covering this ball that comes just off your left hip. But this is going to be one of those automatic times, particularly if when my partner hits a serve up the tee, I see duress or reaching. This is just going to be one of those times where if you're trying to figure out, I just want to get involved with the net more. I want to poach more off my partner's serve. When do I do it? This is by far the number one opportunity that you can start playing with and you're going to see the best results, I think, the quickest. Yeah. So do you want to talk about And the same thing applies on the ad side. Obviously, when you're playing a right or left hander, um, this can vary because maybe on the ad side against a righty, you know, you're looking at a forehand there, but the, the same rules apply that same, that same pattern, that same difficulty in getting the ball back behind them down the line, that same lack of angle exists obviously on the ad side as well. So that is, I would say the biggest visual cue when your partner is serving, do you want well, to move into some more lighter, not as obvious cues? Yeah. Um, but with that, like w visually, just so for, for you guys, what is it specifically you're looking for? Maybe you, you're not comfortable with signals. Maybe you're not talking about where the ball is going. There's a lot of players that if they go, hey, where are you, you, know, where are you serving? You know, this guy's like, I'm going to get it in. That's where I'm going to go. Yeah. So you don't know that it's going tee. So what are we looking for other than just the ball going down the tee or in the deuce court or the ad court? We're looking for what the returner is doing. And Scott touched on it as far as – the, the reaching, but I want you guys to really see this. So if I'm the returner and the minute that I get pulled and I start showing my back, right? That's a great time to poach. We each have a really funny saying that covers this instruction in right. general. Mine is if you see buns run, meaning if I reach and you see my butt, then sorry. I'm, I'm not sorry out there interwebs. And uh, you should run in. What is yours? <laughs> mine is uh, baby's got back. You got to attack, <laughs> you know, a little Sir mix a lot, yeah, right? Go. But so that's the idea. If, if I'm turned, I can't really generate all that much power, right? I'm going to be working through extension. Worst case, maybe it's a lob. Um, but either which way, you still should be looking to poach, right? If it's a weak lob, you can still take a step back. If your partner needs to cover, that's totally fine as well. But that is, that is absolutely step one. Now, if we see someone gearing up, right, and they're here, this is the other thing that we're looking for. If my chest stays relatively open to where you can see the W, I'm going to be able to stay open and get my leg on the outside of the ball in order to pull it back. But if my shoulders start to square and I'm here, it's going to be much harder for me to get the angle of the ball because I'm going to have the ball much more behind me, assuming this is a first serve with decent pace. So those are two things that you're looking for just to add on to that particular particular ball yeah and i'll give you one one step further to what nate just said too i think this will this will be useful for you when you see baby got back got to attack when you see them reaching you can kind of take off right like you don't have to wait and see what's going to happen like they're on defense your partner serves t and that guy's reaching that guy or girl is reaching and and clearly playing defense that's a great time to just take off and poach when your partner serves t and you see your opponent wind up to the two in a backhand it's still a decent time to poach you just can't leave as early because if you leave early, this line does still exist, right? You've got to hold a little bit longer, wait for their eyes to drop to the ball, uh, and then take off. So we, I was just going to say, this is a great time to talk about the sneaky poach. All right, so the sneaky poach, it's, it's actually Scott's tip, but I'll talk about it because I actually have a hat on today. <laughs> so regardless of where they're at on the court, if you're looking for the moment to leave, right? We hear this feedback all the time. But when do I leave? You're telling me when to, what to look for, but I left too early. They saw it. I left too late. I didn't get there, right? So a fantastic visual cue, one I really, really like, is the sneaky poach. And what this is, the minute that I line up to hit the ball and I'm wearing a cap or a visor, the minute you can't see my eyes, I can't see you, right? And so it doesn't happen every time. I'm going to reiterate that because that's really important. Think yeah. about this. If you can't see their eyes, their eyes can't see you. That means you can do whatever you want at that point in time. The second their eyes are covered, you can do whatever you want in terms of poaching without them realizing it, right? Yeah. Yep. So, it, you know, obviously if they're not wearing a hat, it's not as easy to tell. And we, we do want, as, as tennis players, we want to focus on keeping our heads still 
at, at, you know, during these ground strokes. So we're often taught, you know, to, to lower the head to stabilize or get the chin out to the ball. So a lot of times this is going to happen. And this is a great moment you can learn to push. Now, if they're not wearing a hat, what I always advise is, is just like you would hit your split step um, at contact on the serve, make sure that you're getting loaded and you're ready to get into action as they're ready to make contact. So that little split step forward right before contact and then you're boom, you're gone, right? Now, of course, if they're stretched out, like Scott said, you can leave a little bit earlier. But the sneaky poach, next time you're in the court, that's like the easiest time to really start developing the, the, the cadence, the timing of like, when should I leave, right? The minute you can't see their eyes. So let me put a bow on what we've covered so far for you, and then we'll move on to what this looks like during the point and some other things to look for. So the big thing that we've covered so far, the big visual cue, when you're up at the net, your partner is serving. When that ball goes T, great time to poach. If your opponent is reaching, you can take off right away. If your opponent is setting their feet to hit their backhand, you can still poach, but you're going to hold position a little bit longer so you don't show your hand. And then maybe the most important part, you're going to apply this throughout the point as well. When do I poach? When do I take off? When my opponent's set? When their eyes drop to the ball, if they're wearing a hat or a visor, when you can't see their eyes, their eyes can't see you. So that's what we've covered so far. Let's erase this and get into all the different situations that arise when this ball is moving back and forth throughout the point, yeah? Let's do it. I'm going to knock this down. Uh, before we do that, I guess we should probably open up the floor for questions. So as I clean this off, again, we're on a delay here. Drop some questions. If you have any questions about the sneaky poach, the idea of like when their eyes drop, just anything poaching related um, as it pertains to what we've talked about so far, feel free to drop it in the comments. And if you guys don't have any questions yet, that's cool as well. Just going to go ahead and get us all set up here. An impressive era. Okay, thanks, dude. All right. Uh, Kelvinator says, very useful already. Chaps will be using these tips this weekend. That's thanks, fantastic. Kelly. Glad Appreciate to hear it, man. Glad, glad you're enjoying it. Um, let's see here. Megan wants to know, and this is actually a great question, and we cover this in a lot more detail in this Doubles Movement Mastery course, but I'll do it for you right now. So Megan wants to know, why is this player starting in the middle of the box? Shouldn't they be covering their line more? So let me tell you why, because this is important. Um, I think a lot of us think, man, I've got to stand here because I don't want to get burned down the line off the return. Can everyone say hi to my dog, Ava? Can you face the camera? Why are you so shy? <laughs> All right. She's very distracting. She <laughs> snuck in the office as we closed the door here to start this live stream. All right. So sorry. I think a lot of you, ADD, I think a lot of you think when your partner is serving, you've got to hug the double sideline here because you're gonna get burned down the line. And that might be true if your partner is serving out wide. If that ball is coming right here and it's pulling your opponent out wide, then yes, there is a lot of space here if you stand in the middle of the court. And that's why we're gonna have you stand in the middle of the box and when your partner serves out wide, shift. And we talk a lot about this in our doubles course about how important it is to follow the ball when you're up here at the net. And what you're going to see throughout the point, you see this arrow going back and forth. As this ball travels back and forth, we're traveling with it, plugging the holes in the court. So when my partner, for example, serves out wide, this is the hole I need to plug. This is the space that's exposed. When that ball goes back towards my partner who is serving, now I'm worried about this player who's also shifted to the net, hitting a ball to the middle of the court. So I shift and follow it. I don't want you to overcomplicate that. If you try and memorize what I just said, and then implement it in the middle of a point, your head is going to explode. Think about it way simpler. Just chase the ball. If the ball's moving this way, you're going to chase the ball, and you're going to keep your eyes on the net player. The ball's moving this way, you're going to chase the ball, and your eyes are going to be on the baseline player, the player that can do the damage. So that's an important part to everything we're going to talk about today. And Megan, that answers your question also of why we're seeing in the middle of the box here. If you start over here and your partner serves T, you've got a lot of distance to get back to the middle and then poach, so you're just not gonna be as active. So we'd like to see you start in the center of the service box, 
and then shift based on what your partner does with their serve. I hope that helps. That's where that doubles movement mastery class is. It, it puts this all into perspective, right? So like the, the one thing I'm going to show you is that for you players that are statues and you're worried about the alley, look at all this real estate your partner has to cover, right? So what Scott's talking about where you're following with the ball, here you're in a predator position, here you're protector. You're protecting middle when the ball is over here. So by the chance your partner hits the net player, you can help. If this, if your partner hits a really good ball, you're moving forward to be aggressive. But, but Megan, like when we're talking about like protecting the line, it's like playing blackjack and being worried that the dealer is going to hit on 17, right? The, the down the line is the most difficult shot, highest part of the net, shortest part of the court. Now, with that being said, if they throw up a meatball, right? Like it's, it's only, but so hard, but with a decent serve, it's still relatively difficult to play that ball down the line. So it doesn't make any sense to protect it. Right. right. Well, I think it's personal, right? You get passed down the line. You're like, how oh, dare you? I'm not going to let that how happen again. Dare you? Yeah. But it's just one point. Yeah. All right, cool. So I hope, hopefully I've set the framework here to sort of talk about, um, what happens as the point wears on. So let's start to talk about these cues. I think we all at times just feel lost up here at the net. Like we don't really understand what we're supposed to be doing. Hopefully what I just told you, this following the ball back and forth as this continues, as the point continues, is going to give you some guidance. But then you're going to want to know, all right, well, like I don't want to just, neither one of these two players want to just do this for two out of three sets. And this is why as coaches, we're always telling your partner to get to the net because you're going to get really tired if every single point lasts five to six rallies cross court, two, three, four, five, six. I'd be fainting by the second, third game, screaming at Nate to get up to the net. I'm so out of breath. I'd be like I'm in the gym, dude. Moving. Yeah, <laughs> rude. <laughs> so we've got to talk about one, how to get this player to the net. We cover all that in the course today. More importantly, and I think honestly more exciting for you guys, is how do we get involved up here to get out of this endless pattern of following the ball? How do we poach? What do we look for? So let's start to talk about as the point wears on some obvious things. You want me to go first or you? you you're All right, on the running start, dude. I'll Let's go. Go. I'll go again the easiest instruction first because Nate's a better coach than I am. I'm a better player though. <laughs> so wow. if – Disagree. And I hope you guys can see this. I'm trying to draw thick here. If you hit, and by you, I mean if your baseline partner drives a ball deep into the court, pushing your opponent back off the baseline, a ball that lands anywhere in here, this is going to be a good opportunity to poach. Um, the more middle, the better, because as we learned, when your partner serves up the tee, this angle becomes more and more difficult. But what's important about when your partner pushes your opponent back off the baseline is it creates more distance between you and the ball. The hardest time to poach is when this player gets inside the baseline, right? If I'm pulling this player in, I don't have much time to do anything. I don't have much time to react to a ball down the line. When I am all the way, you know, three times the distance away from this player, when this player is pushed way off the baseline, now I've got sort of unlimited time to go close that ball off. So just the distance the ball has to travel gives me more time to poach, which makes it an easier time to do so. Yep. And so a lot of you out there might be thinking, okay, so if the ball is really deep in the court, aren't they going to lob? Yes, but it should be so abundantly obvious. And so although it's not necessarily poaching, what we're talking about today, we are talking about visual cues. And I think this is extremely important. If your opponent has their racket down low or their racket coiled, right? Like they're, they're, they're looking to drive the ball. They're looking to hit through the court. That is when we should be poaching. Right, because of just what Scott just spoke on and the amount of time you have to see it and the difficulty of your opponent getting the ball around you. If you see them doing this, they're lobbing, right? Like it makes no sense for it to look like they're they're hitting a volley from behind the baseline. This is what we call the slob, the slice lob. Now, could they drop back and hit a top spin lob? Yes, if the ball was shorter in the court, but at that depth it's going to be really difficult for them to get away from it and then throw up the tops and lob at that depth. Most players are taking the ball and lobbing. So if you saw a player doing this, then you're not going to run to the middle of the court. You maybe drop back into a hover or whatever else it might be. Um, 
but that should be pretty obvious, right? That's the one that I feel like you and I both harp on a lot with our students is that they get beat by the lob and we're like, how, how did you, you have to be able to see this. Well, and it's funny because we, we will talk to our students and they're like, well, I just can't see it. And then I'll say, am I driving or lobbing? And they're like, you're driving. And I'm like, am I driving or lobbing? And they're like, you're lobbing. And I'm like, you can see it. You just need to apply what you understand yeah. to the point, right? So, like you guys know this. It's just making sure in real time you do something with the information. So let's talk about why we don't see it, all right? Because it's it's the same. <laughs> I, I told a student this a while a while back. I was like, young man. And I was like, you know how like when you have a breakout, you, you don't want to go to school and you're all concerned about what everybody's saying about their breakout. I'm like, the truth is they're more concerned about their breakouts than worrying about yours. Like everybody's going through the same stuff, right? So on the tennis court, what we do is we nice hit a ball. teen angst analogy, by the way. I had this well talk done. with another kid. Yeah, it was an honest conversation. There you go. It was a little breakthrough moment. But so what ends up happening on the tennis court is I hit a ball and I go, how good or how bad was it? I'm like immediately trying to assess a judgment, uh, you know, to whatever I've hit. But the information I'm supposed to be collecting is the ball has left my strings. There's nothing I can do about it. How good I can't control it after it's left my strings. But what I can do is collect valuable data. My opponent is going to tell me how good or how bad it was. If they start stalking towards me, <laughs> right? My ball wasn't that good. If they start going backwards, right? See the bottom of my shoe, then it was probably a pretty darn good shot, right? That is the information that we want to be collecting. Those are the visual cues that we really want to be be looking for. And that on that deep ball is 100% right. That's good coaching. So really, I'll extend this through the middle of the court here because we talked about this, right? As long as we're not pulling them inside the baseline with their feet. So really, any ball that bounces in this area that pulls them either really deep or at least stays behind the baseline and pulls them towards the middle, this is a great visual cue and a great indicator that we should take off and poach. All right, you want to go over number two? Yeah, so the next – marker? Yeah, next one's good. So the other one, we're going to work in the complete opposite direction. All right. I worked so hard to I know, I know. It's hell? pretty. I'm sorry. I, I contemplated yeah. leaving it there, but I didn't want it to be confusing. All right, so the next one that we're this looking we for – can't have nice things because Nate erases them. I do apologize. I'd also like to point out that the dog is so scared of you that she is now sat hey, behind me in the corner of the room. Sorry, Ava. All right, so this next one, and this can be set up with the play we call dink em and dunk em. And this is something you guys, you, you may be out there, a lot of men and women use this as a very resourceful tool. They use really low slice to bring you in, right? So at first thought, it might not be that dangerous because we want to be at the net, but we want to be at the net in our terms. When we're brought to get into the net against our will, we're, we're left vulnerable, right? And so this play here, maybe your opponent has a weak second serve, you deploy this like short, you know, soft little slice. If you're playing on a clay court, it's even more advantageous. But so what you're looking for on this particular visual cue as being this player, and obviously this player should be moving in too, is again, what's happening with the racket, all right? So if I'm running in and my palm is open, right, what can I hurt you with? There's two things that could happen that could potentially keep me neutral or an offense as your opponent. One, I could flip up a lob, right? But that's hard to do, that's especially with a really, really low slice. Really, really high level on a full out sprint to softly guide a lob over this net player's head, right? That's that's it's an option, but it's hard unless you're really good at tennis. Difficult, right? And so the second thing I could do is play pickleball, and what I mean by this. Is I've hit I can hear everyone booing. They're like pickleball boo. <laughs> you say that, but we'll be uh, launching pickleball next year. Play your, <laughs> play your pickleball court. Play your, com. We're gonna have to think of a new name. But <laughs> it's not playyourpickle.com. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> All right. So you've hit this ball, and so what ends up happening is this player, according to the height, is going to hover or smother. Right. So like if they're worried, if this person's uh, you know, vertically challenged, then they're going to drop back a little bit. So they don't get, I don't know how to say it nice. Short. But so they're short. If, if they're going to drop back a little bit, right? Because they do have to be a little bit concerned about the lob. This player is moving in because remember what we called this play was the dink and dunk them. And what they're looking for is this player to pop up and to get either a high volley or an overhead. So what I was saying is that this player could potentially hit a lob. That's really hard to do. Or they could play pickleball. 
giving you guys a little bonus stuff. This has nothing to do with, but I just, I like this content. So, but so what would be smart here is as they play in, they've got to play pickleball where they're playing in front of both players to get them to force up. But so here's the point of this drill. None of this is any good if you're not looking for the visual cue. Because if I hit a short chip and I don't see the person running like this, right? They're running in. This, this tells me that they're going to have a hard time getting to the ball. Then I'm not going to go in. I'm not going to look to be aggressive. So this player should look to poach when they see that. This player should pinch and look to poach if this player is running in to get that short ball. This player's here. They're Guys, running in. They pinch too, and cut. Boom. Also, too, like what we're showing you here are visual cues. All of these work as set plays also. Like right out of the gates, we said when your partner serves T – you should look to poach. Ideally, you had some communication with your partner before the point started. They were going to serve T. Nate and I will talk about, hey, man, like I'm back here rallying with this guy. He's got a better cross court forehand than me. I'm going to bring him to the net. Like the first time, I, the first chance I get where I've pushed him off the baseline and I get a ball where I can drop it short, I'm going to, I'm going to dink him. I want you to poach and dunk him. So we'll talk about this. Like this isn't just a visual cue. These are actual strategies you can use as a doubles team to you know to win this cross court rally when maybe you're not the stronger player here. So going back to how we started it, what we were talking about with Scott with the you know good anticipation versus great anticipation, the visual cues are confirmation to a hypothesis. Your hypothesis is I hit short, they're gonna have a hard time getting there, I should move in. The confirmation, right, is oh look, their palm is open. I've confirmed that they're having a hard time getting there. I should definitely move in and look to be aggressive. That's right. Those are the little pieces that we that we miss. But so the set play, when we talk about good anticipation of like, oh, look, they're having a hard time. I should move in and only get to here because you're late confirming the visual cue. At some point, you develop this to where you go, I've got a nasty slice and I'm going to use it because I'm almost positive they're going to pop it up. They're going to hit short and I'll close in. Oh, look, there's the visual cue. And it just becomes this thing that you do and repeat you know, we see Fed do it in singles. We see the Brian brothers use these plays in doubles. They they just have these patterns and they use these confirmations through visual cues to, to become even better at these set plays. That's right. All right. Shall I dive into the third and last visual cue here? Let's get it. You guys, if you have any questions, again, drop them in the chat. I know when we do these podium style coaching sessions, there's not nearly as many questions. But if you have anything as it relates to poaching, feel free to ask. At the end, we will open up for questions on anything and everything if you'd like. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do here is I just want to draw, and this is a dumb name, but this is actually what I call it when I coach my students. I'm going to draw what I call the no-no square. <laughs> the no-no square is where you really, as a baseline player, should not hit the ball very often. All right, so in here... If your partner back here hits a ball into this square, bad things are going to happen. And let me tell you why. When a ball lands inside this square, I haven't pulled my opponent far enough to the middle. I haven't pushed him far enough off the baseline. I haven't done any sort of damage. So when that ball lands anywhere in this square, this player is going to take a step forward or two steps to their left. They're going to set their feet, and they're going to be able to transfer their weight into the shot from a balanced position. This is where... If I were you, I would tell you to play offense from. Whenever a ball lands in this square, this is a great time to attack. So we've talked about the two situations already when, when it's a good time to poach. We've talked about back here, right, where we hit the ball past the no-no square. And Nate just talked about dink em and dunk em, where we hit the ball in front of the no-no square. Now we've got the alley out here. And I'm going to talk about one – that's both positioning based as far as where the ball bounces, but also the visual cue that you've got to see as your opponent covers this ball. And that is, again, an outstretched racket. So again, if we're outside of the no-no square, we should be doing damage. So if, if I'm up at the net, my partner's having success getting the ball outside of this square, either pushing them off the baseline, pulling them forward, or yanking them out wide, we should have taken control of the point. We should see offensive benefit to where this ball has landed. The only, I guess, really exception to this rule 
is when they get pulled out wide and this player is really fast and you see them set their feet and, and wind up, I would be a little hesitant to poach. I might stay home. But when that ball gets pulled out wide, creating this angle, pulling that opponent off the court, and you see them reaching, that's a fantastic time to take off. And you're going to apply what we talked about earlier on this live stream of when you see their eyes drop to the ball, that's when you want to take off. But what you should see when this player is on a full-out sprint and reaching, the last thing they see is their eyes drop to the ball is you sort of hovering over here and they say, okay, I've got to go cross court. The second their eyes drop to the ball, the second their hat or their visor covers their eyes, this is a great time to take off and poach as well. It is a lot more words to explain that than I, than I planned <laughs> the on. The diagram is but, awesome. But do you do you have anything you want to add to this or the no-no square concept in general? Um, I like it. I like it. So, well, the one thing I will add, guys, this is a little bit more high level. Um, if you were playing at a lower level, that no-no square may not it's be such smaller. a no-no, yeah. right? Yeah, it, it may be that like, hey, you're hitting a big high loopy ball and that your opponent backs up because they want to shape it in their strike zone. It's like it's not as devastating. If Scott and I are playing... If, if I don't know, it sounds so pop as you using you and I as an example, I apologize. But if I, Scott and I are playing and either of us hit in the square, one of us is going to get an upper hand in positioning. Um, can I throw a bonus? Can I do a bonus uh, visual cue? Yeah. All right. If you, so if you must. So everyone's speaking of high advance, everybody thinks this particular visual cue is really high advance. Um, that's redundant. But it's uh, <laughs> but it, it's not, and it's something that I'm teaching to to three five players, four zero players, and I think it's really important. I hate to mess up your graphic because this was so Come nice. On. Every time I draw something uh, awesome, Nate erases it. Guy, yeah. can everyone just type a boo into the chat? Boo, Nate. Boo, Nate. Boo, Nate. Nate's the worst. All right, but not now because I'm gonna give you a great bonus tip. That's gonna be your favorite. All right, so seems unlikely. This player, <laughs> this player hits a serve. Or they get an approach shot, right? Whatever they're doing, they're hitting and they're coming in. All right. So what's important here is that when this happens, when this player gets the ball past the net player, right, they've hit to this space, we know that we've got to hover and we've got to drop back in order to protect the middle of the square, right? So like here would be if the ball was moving slow enough, this is a little bit more advanced with the hover smother. I'm sorry, with the uh, yeah, hover smother, it's fine. With, with shifting with the ball. But what I want you to look at here is if this player hits heavy top spin, they hit what we call a dipper, right, to this ball or to this player. What ends up happening is that this player has to volley up, right? So we see the net. When their racket goes below the net, they have to lift if they want to keep the ball in play. This player should no longer be defensive-minded. When this happens, this player should look to pinch. This player should look to pinch. Whether they're, When they're moving forward a couple of steps here, we can go either which way I'll draw it. So you can go here or here on the cutoff. But it is important that you shift back first. Right, and then as they as this ball starts to go back, you're moving forward. You're looking for the pinch, and then you can cut. All right, but this is the visual cue. Anytime the racket is below the net, right? Here's the net. If I'm below the net, I have to clear the net, and I should be looking as an opponent, or I I should be looking to move when my opponent is in this position. If I'm here above the net, what is that telling you? It's, I'm probably defending. They're looking to like you know really attack and be aggressive. But that's the one that I think gets missed a lot, right? It's like reward this player for their dipper. When Scott and I play together a lot, Scott has a really nice low, uh, low ball that he hits at people's feet. So it's my favorite time to look to move in. But it seems like I might be defensive because the ball's, you know, I'm, th this player moved in on the offense. But you got to reward your, your partner when they hit this dipper. You've got to look to poach. I like it. All right, guys, drop some questions in here. We've got a few in here already that I'll, that I'll jump in here in just a second and answer. But if you have any other questions, poaching specific or anything tennis related that you want us to answer, feel free. Um, I think this is Jan because it's a man. I'm assuming that's not Jan. Jan. I don't know. I think no, it's, Jan, it's right? Jan. It's like Jan telling okay, buddy cool. Jan. All right, so Jan wants to know when you're at the net, 
where should you keep your eye and what should you look for? Um, may I? Yeah. It's so yeah. rare that I know the answer to a question that I feel like. Proud of no, you. I'm kidding. All right. So we talked about earlier on the live stream, Jan, this concept of follow the ball, right? And this is sort of the crux of the answer to your question here. So throughout the point, when you're up at the net and you've got this cross court rally going back and forth, we talked about how we've got to follow this ball back and forth. Um, in terms of our footwork pattern here, this is not a turn around and run. This is a side shuffle. So as I side shuffle back, I'm always going to keep my eyes on who I'm most worried about. And in this case, who I'm most worried about is this net player, right? Once my opponent on the baseline has hit the ball past me, this player cannot do damage to me until the ball passes this player who shifted up to the net. All right, so as this ball returns, what you'll see is both of us shifting, me in this position in the black dot here, my eyes as well as my hips and shoulders as I side shuffle back are going to be squared off towards the player I'm worried about. And please, please, please do not turn your gaze back to the baseline player. You're not going to get any information from back here, all right? If you're up at the net and you turn back and you look at what your partner's doing, they hit that ball, you're going to turn right back around just to get hit in the face with a volley from this white dot player. So when you've backed all the way up, you're keeping your eyes on this player, you're going to get all the visual cues you need about what happened back here from how they look. If this person looks like they're running back to cover a lob, well, then your, your partner hit a great lob. If this person looks like they're getting ready to hit an overhead, you need to be running away. So my eyes are here. Now, the opposite is obviously true. Once this ball actually passes this net player, now I'm going to turn both my hips, shoulders, and my eyes back to who I'm worried about now, which is the baseline player that can burn me down the line. So as I turn and shift I am at this point running and somewhat of a full out sprint to follow the ball in the direction that it was hit. And if that direction is a sharper angle, then you're going to see me create a sharper angle with my feet and cover more of the alley. If that ball was pushed more towards the middle, you're going to see me move more towards the middle of the box and look to pinch. But my eyes in this case are going to be looking again at the player that I'm worried about. That's right. So it's a player, when the ball goes behind you, you look to the person that can attack you first. And once the ball clears that person, your eyesight goes back to the person farthest from you, which would be the person at the baseline. Cool. Got another question here from the Gilmer family. Howdy. When I'm on the receiving side at the net, as my partner returns serve, how far in towards the center should I be? Dibs again. <laughs> you can just go home. Let's say I'm going to take a little nap. This is good. <laughs> Because this is my favorite, this is my favorite instruction that a lot of players mess up. And it's like this just so quickly fixes a lot of the mistakes that we see. So maybe the biggest mistake, and actually when I give you guys this link for this double zoom mastery course, the example video from the course in there talks about the number one mistake, the number one reason all points at the rec level are lost. This is it. So when your partner serves. Returners here, excuse me, when your partner is returning and you are in this position, the biggest mistake we see is players posting up right here in the middle of the box. And the reason this is a mistake is because even at the highest level of play, not all the time are we going to get the ball past this net player. So if this ball does not make it past this net player, especially if they've watched this live stream or done our doubles course, they're looking to poach. Look at all of this stuff base they have to hit into if that's where you're standing. All right, so the adjustment here is to pull yourself back into the middle, plug this huge lane in the court, and then once your partner actually gets the ball past this net player, then we shift and follow the ball. So Gilmer family, that's a great question as it pertains as we follow the ball. It's the same concept, it's just before the point starts, hold this position until you're positive this ball has cleared this net player and this center lane is no longer an issue, and then shift to cover whatever you see based on your partner's return of serve. 
Yeah, I mean, we always tell them, you know, get that out, out, outside foot to the T, right? And whether you're behind it or inside it, but I mean, middle is middle, right? Like you're trying to protect as much of middle as you can. Yeah. Uh, Jan says, great info. Thanks. I'm mainly a singles player, uh, but knowing this stuff will help me not have my doubles partner hate me if I play pickup <laughs> games. You're welcome, Jan. We Our pleasure, it. man. Ho hope it helps. Feel free to drop some more questions in here. Guys, we're getting close to the end of the call. So what I'm going to do here, as promised, we do have this doubles movement mastery course. If you're a plus member, do not go to this link and buy this because you already have access to it for free. So if you're a player court plus member, make sure you go to your premium video courses section. There's a course called doubles movement mastery in there. It's going to go over everything we just talked about in full detail. But if you're not a player court plus member and you want 75% off on this course, I'm going to drop a link in all channels here right now where you guys can go check it out. And you'll also see, um, if you're on Periscope watching this, go to our go to our YouTube <laughs> go to our YouTube live stream to see this comment there because apparently uh, Periscope won't let me post. But if you're on Facebook or YouTube watching this, you should see that comment. Um, what you'll see on that lander is me actually talking about exactly what we just talked about the follow the ball secret and how this is the number one reason players are losing points and leaving huge holes open in the court. But we talk about poaching, we talk about cues to get to the net. There's a ton of great stuff in that course. So definitely check that out. Take advantage um, of this discount. That link is only for you guys in this live stream. There's no way you would have even found that landing page without that link. So check that stuff out. Um, do you want to do a quick recap of the visual cues that we've covered today? And then we can wrap up and answer any final questions. I think you got, you covered more, the majority of them you cover. Get, let's go. Yeah. You want I'm, me to just I'm go? excited for you. All right. <laughs> Nate's so used to having to do all the work. Oh, no, He's excited nice. to, let, to let Scott seen cover a, it off. An espresso and you know, maybe <laughs> all right. So salt. just to give you a recap, purpose of the live stream today was to give you guys some visual cues to know when to poach when you're up at the net. The first thing we talked about is when your partner is serving. So before the point even starts, if your partner is serving up the tee, it's a great time to poach, particularly if you see your opponent reaching, you can take off right away. If you see that partner getting pulled towards the tee and taking a full swing, it's still a good opportunity to poach, but you're going to hold your position a little bit longer to make sure they don't burn you down the line. Um, then we talked about what happens as the point gets started and this ball is moving back and forth in a cross-court pattern. We talked about something we called a no-no square, which is basically a no, man, no man's land on the opposite side of the court. Anytime a ball lands here, it's not a very good time to poach, but outside of the no-no square – or we've pushed our opponent back off the baseline, giving ourselves more time, or we've dinked our opponent short inside the no-no square where they're running and reaching, or we've pulled them really wide and we see them reaching. Those are all excellent times to poach. And finally, I know the number one question we get from students is, well, when? So I understand I'm supposed to poach, but when do I take off? When you see their eyes, their eyes see you. When their eyes drop to the ball and that hat or visor covers their eyes, if you can't see their eyes, their eyes can't see you. That's when you take off and commit 100% to poaching. And if they're not wearing a hat, remember, it's just before contact, right? And the last one, you missed one. That was good, though. You got, you got most of them. Oh, your bonus content? That counts. Yeah, I don't cover your well, bonus it, content. It, That's it, your bonus so the, bo <laughs> the bonus and the uh, the – the uh, the dinkum.com if the rackets below I talked about dinkum and dunkum. Yeah, really. Yeah, if you're you're running and reaching. Yeah, you did a little bit. He just doesn't listen. The the main uh takeaway though is if your opponent's racket is below the net, yeah. What we talked about with the dipper, if they're below the net, they have to lift. So once that racket goes below the net, it's a great time to poach. That's all I got. All right. Gilmer family says great info. Megan says thank, thank you. you so much. Pleasure. Uh, Gilmer family thanks says, so much for watching, guys. Yeah, guys, thanks for tuning in. Gilmer family says um, your video on holding the racket with three fingers teacup style on the serve for more power was super helpful. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that video uh, has, has been well received. I'm, I'm, I'm really – Scott and I are both really thrilled that's, uh, that, that's helping people because that's a big one on the serve. That's Yeah, getting that racket drop is tough. Yeah. Um, oh, here we go. FYI, I just bought a custom Wilson blade thanks to your video on getting the custom Wilson yes. racket. We probably should give a nice Wilson plug here because they really take care of us. So we did put out a video. Um, actually, I'm holding it in my hand right now. So you can go design your own custom Wilson frame. So this is actually the Roger Federer, what is it, the 97 Pro Staff, um, but with my own custom camo and lava red 
grommet and headguard pattern. So that's that would a thing be you can do. If you're inside the player court community, don't forget you get deals and discounts on everything, huge discounts on Wilson stuff. So and for buying, the holidays, what a gift. Yeah, man. If you're I mean, this saying it sounds like a shameless plug, but like we uh, I designed a racket for my pops, who's a Florida State alumni. So I did it in the the garnet and gold. And he was blown away. Probably his favorite gift he's ever got. He can't even decide whether he wants to play with it or put it on a wall. Yeah, put it on the trophy. Yeah, so if you need a holiday gift. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And I know I'm lucky because I, I love the all matte black Roger Federer racket. Like, it looks cool. But everybody has their own color preferences. So, like, I, I get that a racket feels good, but it's not the colors that you want. Well, now it can be. So definitely check that out. Um, and I think that's all we got for you today, today guys. Uh, one more time, I'll drop that link in here. You want to check out the Doubles Movement Mastery course. We'd love to have you inside. And if you decide, hey, man, $49 uh, just doesn't seem like a good deal for a course, join Player Court Plus and you'll get access to all the courses we've ever created. It's every course, so yeah. If you want to get access to that doubles course and get a, uh, a deeper dive on what we're talking about today, those are your two options. So appreciate you guys watching. We will see you next time. Thanks, guys. See ya.